We will begin with a prayer, and we'll ask Steve if you'll lead us in a prayer. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day of giving us. We thank you for everything that you give us every day. We thank you for everyone in this classroom, what they mean to Maisel. Thank you for Ron and what he's prepared. Help us to uh, just grab on to whatever he's got for us today and just run with it. Thank you for everything you give us. Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 John's been talking about faith. He's talking about uh, unbelief and why people become unbelievers. Uh, staying with that particular topic, I thought we would look at three things. Number one, the word faith. You probably have one of those iPads that'll tell you how many times the word faith is found in the New Testament. Uh, you'll be surprised how many times it is found. Just the word faith. Typically, when you're talking about faith, what are you talking about? Our faith. Our faith, our personal faith, or an individual's personal faith, their response to God. Now, the multiplied number of times are, are, are there. Uh, did you talk about Hebrews 11 no. in your class? Uh, it's vital, I believe, that you keep in mind that in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we sometimes say, well, here's a definition of faith. Well, if it's a definition or you're going to use it as a definition, what is faith according to Hebrews 11 and verse 1? Next. The evidence of things not seen. Substance of things so far. And the evidence, of, evidence things of things not seen. You're going to find out that that is talking about future things, not... Uh, things that having to do with personal integration. Yet the 11th chapter of Hebrews is extremely important because it tells us what about faith? I realize I'm pulling you along and I've got a string on your tongue, so go ahead. Is it essential to please God? I mean, yeah, it is. Verse 6, yeah. without it you can't please God. But then the rest, the, the bulk of the chapter is basically telling us here is the way faith behaves. Here's what faith does. Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. You just go right through the book. You're going to find that by faith, and it's talking about by individual's personal conviction and confidence in God, here is the way faith behaves. Here's what you're looking at. But now here's a question that's not a trick question. In fact, it's a vital question. What is the difference between faith and the faith? Can you think of a verse that has the expression the faith in it? You probably can. I'll give you one. Earnestly contend for the faith. That's Jude. Jude chapter 9, verse 3, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's only one chapter there. Jude verse 3, earnest contend for the faith. And what do you think Jude is talking about? Is he talking about personal faith? Our personal conviction? Our personal confidence? Or is he talking about something, something very distinct? Mm -hmm. Same thing that Luke wrote about with the way. The way, all right. Uh, and the faith is synonymous with equals what? What does it equal? The faith in, for the Christian, what does it represent? The gospel. The gospel. The faith. Now, strangely enough, we've got one verse out of the way. How many times in the New Testament does it reference or speak of the faith? Guess. See how many gets, who gets close. There are 40 references in the New Testament to the faith. There are about five references to the faith of Christ. We'll get to that as time permits. If you want to look at that word you're going to find in the original, it is the word ek. 
Now, most of the time, we read and we talk about faith in Christ. Well, regrettably, most translations will take the word EK and they'll translate it in, and it doesn't translate in. You can mistranslate it in, but you cannot translate it in. It is the word of, the faith of Christ. If we talked about the faithfulness of, of God, what are we talking about? We're talking about God's faithfulness. And I borrow that language because it is biblical. And number one, because it connects with this particular thought here. And someone says, well, if, if ek does not translate in, what does translate in? Well, here's the word that translates, translates in. It's in Christ. Faith in Christ. We would ask the question, do you believe in Christ? Well, what do we mean when we talk about the faith of Christ? What do we mean? Because of that gospel again, really, aren't you? Uh, it encompasses... Uh, What he, what he stood for and what he, uh, what he exemplified in his life. All right. Which was the Father's will. Keep pulling it up. Keep yeah. pulling it up. What are you dealing with? Uh, are we saved by our imperfect faith or by his perfect faithfulness? His perfect faithfulness. Now, that's one way of getting a hold of the subject yeah. because you're dealing with that very large subject. Now, we're going to look at those verses, if you will, at the very beginning of our study today you look at the language of th this particular text, you're going to find yourself dealing with this concept and I'm going to ask you to go to Romans 3 and verse 22. Romans 3 and verse 22. <clears throat> Somebody get there, read it. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. And you're reading what? New King James? Uh, yes, New King James. New King James. Mm -hmm. uh, John, how many translations you got on that pad of yours? I've got, uh, I think, four. How many of you have a King James translation? i got one right here. Read the King James translation. Romans 3 and 22. <clears throat> Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. Alright, now let's leave it. There's the King James. Let's look at the translations we've got. Do you see anything peculiar about the, that arrangement when you look at verse 22? Even the righteousness of God which is through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Now you have subjective personal faith in that expression on all who believe, but you have a very different expression through the faith of Christ. Our faithfulness is in, our faith is a response to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now to get a hold of that, go back to one time, what did Jesus pray in the garden? Not my will but thine be done. What does that evidence? Evidence he was yielding to God's will and submissive to God. He was his faith, the faith of yeah. Jesus Christ. Now, I can't explain why uh, translations will take the word ek and translate it in when the word is of. Can you? No, it doesn't really make it as clear, does it? No. But here's what's interesting. If we leave it the faith in Christ to all and on all who believe. What kind of expression is that? It is redundant. It is redundant. Uh, someone says it's saying the same thing twice in one sentence. But it isn't saying the same thing twice in one sentence. It is not talking about faith in Christ unto all who believe, but the faith of Christ unto all who believe. 
Now, what I have done with my New King's translation, King James translation, is every time I find those verses where it says in, I, transla I, I put off, because that's the word of. It is the word ek, ek. It is the faith of Christ unto all who believe. Now, I also think that it's vital that we get a hold of this concept that we are not saved by <coughs> our fallible faith in and of and by itself. We are saved by the infallible faith of Jesus Christ. Any question or comment? John? All right. You ever wrestled with this before? Touched on it. Yes, touched on it. All right. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And you're going to find an expression in verse 16. We'll start with verse 15. Someone read verse 15 and 16 for us from Galatians chapter chapter 2. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put in have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because of the works of the law no one will be justified all right now I'm going to suggest to you again read it carefully we're not justified by the works of the law but we are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ it's are we justified by faith in Christ? Well, we're told that in Romans 5.1. But that's not what this verse is saying. And again, you've got this word, which should be translated of, not this word, which can be translated <coughs> in or into. We are justified what? We're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had not been faithful, had not been obedient, well, back up for a moment, I've brought up another subject here, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. What does it say about Jesus in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9? He is the what? The author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Obey Him. Now, wait a minute. I've branched beyond the word faith. Not really. This is what's interesting, too, when you begin dealing with the word faith, and you'll find it rather interesting. What does this word here actually mean? That's the word that's translated faith. It's the word that's translated faith. And what does the word pistuo mean? You ready? It is trust that culminates in obedience if obedience is required. Oh, well, wait a minute. You mean, well, here's, here, what, what does the gospel contain? That's the way to get a hold of it. What does the gospel contain? It only contains three things. Facts, promises, and commands. She's been in my class before. The gospel funny. contains facts. What are the facts of the gospel? Christ died for our sins, was buried, and arose again the third day, and all of that was according to the Scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15. I didn't make that up. Uh, those are the facts of the Gospel. How many of you know how to obey a fact? You can. Accept it as truth. A fact is something that is true no matter what you do, but you can. what can you do with a fact? If it's a biblical fact and you trust God, you trust the biblical fact. Uh, what are the promises contained in the gospel? What are the promises that we have in the gospel? Remission of sin. Remission of sin, number one. What else? The promise of heaven. The promise of heaven, that's number three. What's number two? <laughs> Remission of sins. The gift of sonship. The gift of sonship. What are we in Christ? Well, we're forgiven, but we're more than that. What are we? We are made children of God. We're sons and daughters of God, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. And we are heirs according to the what? The 
promise. And the promise is the promise of life. How many of you know how to break, obey a promise? Any way to obey a promise? No. No, you can't obey a promise, but you what can you do with a promise? Trust the one who made it to keep it. You can trust the one who made it to keep it. Now, I suppose some people, I, I, I had one fellow that I worked with, he was the most promising fellow that I ever met. He was always making promises, but there was something else about him. He didn't keep his promises. He really didn't. Uh, that's sad when you begin thinking, does God keep his promises? He does. No, when we trust God, we trust God to fulfill his promises. Do we always understand how God is working out his promises in our lives? We don't. Well, what is our choice? Our choice is to trust him, live for him, and he will do what? He will do what is right. Nothing will separate us from his love. He will deliver us from temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13, and you multiply those. He, he will cause all things to work together for good, Romans 8, 28. And that's a promise, isn't it? Those promises, we cannot play the hand until God plays the hand. But here's trust that culminates in obedience. But here's the phrase, if obedience is required. Now, why would that be in the definition? I'm glad it is. But why would it be in the definition? Because that's part of the definition. Now you start off with a definition. We can define a certain thing and leave off part of the definition. Do we have an understanding of what that thing is? No, we don't. But when you find a definition, you stay with the definition. Now the definition is that it is trust that culminates in obedience. If now, where is, first of all, go back, what's the big part? It's trust. What's faith? It is trust. It is trust that culminates in something. What does it culminate? It trusts in obedience if obedience is required. If there is no obedience required, there's no obedience that is necessary. But when you start thinking with regard to the faith, it contains, the gospel contains facts, promises, and commands. And those facts, promises, and commands are our response to God. We accept the, the facts. We trust the promises. And we trust God when he gives a command. How do we demonstrate that we trust God? Obeying. By obeying what he says. Now, I don't know whether to put all that up there or not. But I, I think you can begin to look at, at the language and you'll find yourself dealing with that. And that's, that becomes significant because you're going to work with people who have the idea, most people have the idea that faith is simply what? Belief. Pardon? Belief. Belief. All right. What else would you say some people believe? Think with regard to faith. It's just trust. It's just confidence. It's just conviction and what is dismissed 99 times this may be a little maybe not be exactly accurate but 99 times out of four most people say trust and conviction and confidence and they leave out what obedience. obedience they leave it out well if they leave it out what are they doing they're not honoring the dictate of the term the word faith this dual which means trust that culminates in obedience if obedience is required. And when you start talking about the gospel, you're talking about facts, promises, and commands. That's what you're talking about. That originate with Christ, and they rest upon what? They rest upon what? They rest upon the faithfulness of Christ. He was faithful unto him that made promise. And here's the language you have in this particular text. Notice something else with regard to this. He says in verse 16, We know that no man is justified by the works of the law, but by faith. Your translation says what? Oh. In Jesus Christ. You've got yours, haven't you? I'm on the King James. You're on the King James. And this is strange. The King James is the only one that does that. Uh, I, I regret that. The standard says in. Yeah. 
New King James says in. Uh, I was reading uh, one of the most popular and uh, for over a hundred years, one of the most popular commentaries and the one who even argued that the word ek here, which usually is translated of, actually means in. By whose determination? Whose determination? It is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the faithfulness of God to which we, in which we place our trust. It is the faithfulness of the gospel of Christ to which we place our trust. Now notice the verse again, that we might be justified by faith in Christ. Guess what the word there is? That's the middle part of verse 16, the latter part of verse, by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ. And it's the word in, E-N, and not by the works of the law. Look at verse 20 of Galatians 2. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, of <laughs> ek. ek it is the faith of Jesus Christ the faith of the Son of God I live by faith of the Son of God your trust is not in just a system your trust is in Christ your trust is in his gospel and there's the point that needs to be looked at look at Galatians 3 and verse 12 You got it? Mm -hmm. The law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. The law is not of faith. That's verse 12. Now, go over to the language of... Uh, this is interesting. Uh, and while I'm going to deviate for a moment, if you really want to understand and grasp the connection of the law of Moses to the Christian life, what chapter do you need to master? Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Yeah. Galatians 3. Two to the brain is coming. That's right. You've got to master Galatians chapter 3. He points out the law is not of faith. Verse 12. Uh, he makes the argument very, very clear that uh, we are involved in the he raises the question in verse 19, uh, what purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till what? Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It was appointed through angels by the hands of a mediator. Uh, is the law against the promises of God? That's verse 21. Certainly not. For there, if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confirmed, find all under sin, under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ. Did you find of in that verse? It's the word ek. All Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And this is interesting. In each of the passages, Galatians 2.16, uh, this text here, Galatians 3 and verse 22 uh, it talks about the translation has faith in Christ upon all who believe. Well, that's redundant. It's saying the same thing twice in one verse. And it doesn't say same, the same thing twice in one verse. It talks about the faith of Christ extending the blessings of God to unto all those who put their trust in them, the, the faithfulness of Christ. Now, this is interesting, verse 23, but before... The faith came. Does your say faith, the faith, John? Which verse? Verse 23. Verse 23? Yeah. But before faith came. Good. Keep reading. We were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. All right. Now this translation says, before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for? The faith. The faith. Which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. To who? To Christ, who is faithful, that we might be justified by 
faith, the faith, and after the faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Verse 26, for we're all children of God through faith of Christ Jesus. It's the ek. That ek just reached up and says, smite you, got you. And that's the language. Any question or comment about this particular text? Go ahead. Talk about that. Well, as I'm saying, you know, spinning off of what you were alluding to while ago about the old law in Christ and the, and the uh, relationship there, that tutor concept there, you know, is we think about some somebody that helps educate you better about a subject. Yeah. And uh, that's what the old law did. It helped us understand more about the new law we live under because of the deficiency, in a sense, of the old law. Okay. Um, I guess there's a lot of things we we learn about over time uh, that if you look back 50 years ago with you know how we dealt with electricity or you know a lot of things yeah. there were some things that brought us along. Yeah. Uh, but now we have a little more perfect knowledge about how to deal with those issues than we did before. It's rather interesting. The word tutor has a specific meaning. You, you allude to it in your comment. Uh, the word tutor is a very different word, though, in the in that day and age. Yeah. What was the tutor? A trusted servant. A tutor was a trusted servant, and what was he trusted with? He was trusted with safeguarding the children. Right until they were brought to the school where they were put under the hands of the instructor. Yeah. <clears throat> Draw me a parallel. What do we have in a parallel to that today? School bus driver. School bus driver. Yeah. <laughs> Is the school bus driver the teacher? You may learn a lot from your school bus driver, but the school bus driver is, is simply the one charged with bringing the children to the place of education so that they can be instructed by the teachers that are there. And that's the parallel between tutor. The tutor in that text is paralleled by a school bus driver. Everybody, everybody see that? Everybody say, uh-huh, uh, thank you. You began dealing with this whole thing. What was the law? The law was a tutor, a, a, a safeguard, a trusted servant to bring us to a point. And it was bringing us to what? Bringing us to Christ. And when we come to Christ, we are trusting his faithfulness to the Father. <coughs> His perfect obedience and the will which He revealed, and there's the point that He's made. I think there's one more passage that at least I've noted, and it's over in the book of Philippians, uh, chapter three and verse nine, uh, and it's rather interesting to look at this particular con this particular passage. Uh, verse eight, He says, "Indeed, I also count my th all things lost for the excellence of the what? The knowledge of." <laughs> Christ Jesus. Now here's an interesting phrase. You know, we sometimes go down the same street again and again and we don't see the houses. Well, sometimes we'll read verse after verse after verse that says the same and we don't get the point. For instance, he says here that we might have, uh, that we might be, count all things lost for the excellence of the what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus. What kind of knowledge did he have? What kind of knowledge did Jesus have? Perfect. Perfect. Uh, he had perfect knowledge. And he is the source of our knowledge of the things of God. So when he talks about the knowledge of Christ Jesus, it's talking about that which we rely upon so that we can know the Father and know the will of the Father. Uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, but grow in the grace and the knowledge, knowledge of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. What are we supposed to grow in? The grace, the grace stands for all that is characteristic of Him in His majesty, His dignity, His grace. And the knowledge, He is the source of our knowledge. Now let's go back with that concept here. Uh, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain, gain what? Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that righteousness which is through 
the faith of Christ, the righteousness which, which is from God <coughs> by faith. Is he saying the same thing twice in one verse? And that's the curious thing. Every single time that an expression is found in Scripture, you end up with a uh, statement that's a duplicate of the one that precedes it. Do you see it? So you have this, this whole concept that we are justified by the faith of Christ. And our knowledge must be the knowledge of the grace of Christ. And He is the source of all of our knowledge of God's plan and purpose for our life and all that He wants us to know and be. John. A few minutes ago you made reference to a hundred year old commentary. Yeah. For the writer took the faith of Christ and tried to talk about the faith in, in Christ. Christ. Yeah. Why did he do that? Was it to fit his personal denominational view or well that particular man uh, is well known as one who believes in faith only okay and the only reason I can only thing I can say is it fit his prejudice rather than his scholarship it, the reason I bring this up is uh, anybody who writes a commentary is going to have some knowledge of the Corne Greek. Yeah. And one of the first things you learn about the Corne Greek is that it is a dead language. Words don't change, definitions don't change. So he can't take the word ek and conveniently turn it to in. In. Because it is a dead, locked language. Yeah. And there is no disagreement above, between ek and in. I mean, it's an it's a obvious definition. I mean, to me, I don't understand why they would even make that mm -hmm. yeah. translation different when there is two that is explicitly mm -hmm. distinctly way. different. Yeah, I, I understand as you read it, you could easily throw in the difference. In, yeah. But why do it? I mean, I, to me, it's the fact that they they're trying to make a syntax definition instead of a All right. strict translation. Well, let's, go, let's go back to what we were really talking about though. <clears throat> Faith in Christ intimates our personal, our subjective faith in Christ, our personal response to Christ, which is alliterated in all, all those passages except one. It is That is talked about. But it's preceded by the faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Greek language is not only a dead language. Koine Greek is a dead language. It is also a very exacting language. Now you've got an illustration of that in Galatians 3. Uh, in Galatians 3, he makes the distinction that when God talked about the seed, he did not say as of seeds, which is plural. So the argument from Galatians 3 by the inspired writer is, if the word is singular, you don't make it plural. If it's plural, you don't make it singular. If it is objective faith, you don't make it subjective faith. Does that sound like a reasonable requirement, a reasonable rule? If it is personal, it's subjective. And we've got some loose ends. Uh, if it is objective, it is definite, it is specific, and it is large. And to whom do we look? And I think the thing that I keep wrestling with when I look at these, someone said, you don't need to even bring this up, Ronald. Everybody's got a translation that says something different. But I think I do need to bring it up because it is not a preference. It is not simply a preference on my part. Uh, I've used the New King James for almost 30 years, and uh, I find myself upset with translations that push a translation a certain way, And but I find that you can go to the Revised Standard, the English Standard, the American Standard, the New American Standard. I'm not sure about the American Standard, I've got to go back. Uh, any of you acquainted with the American Standard translation 1901? Any of you acquainted with it or used one? Read from the sound, but I, I used one and I used it for a while. You know why I quit using it? Nobody had one. Nobody in the pew was using it. 
I got bumped away from the King James because there were those who kept complaining about the antiquated language, like it's difficult to get a hold of what thee and thou and thine mean, and what they, and wist. Hey, uh, I know a man who was asked to preach a meeting in Marshall <laughs> County several, several years ago, and uh, he didn't mind preaching from New King James or King James whatever. Uh, and the, the church asked him, will you... We want you to preach from the King James Version. He said, sure, no problem, but can I ask why? They said, we want you to use the original language that the, that the apostles used. Yeah. Tell me what you know about translations, your opinion of translations, your view of translations. Obviously, there's some differences. Yeah. What is a translation? It is a what? It should be something that is in this form that is translated into another form. All right. Okay. And it's difficult sometimes to take ancient language and put it in modern language. But a translation is simply a tool. It's a tool. Now, my father was a millwright. And three summers in a row, I helped him remodel houses. He, he would get a job remodeling houses, wiring houses. He had this miserable pair of pliers, big old lock grip pliers, and if you weren't careful, that thing would bite a plug out of you. You had to know how to use it. Well, after about the second or third time, I was ready to refuse to use it. But he said, well, he said, simply a tool, you gotta learn how to use it. <laughs> well, I remember that in this illustration here. You're dealing with the translation. Now, since this is my New Testament, I bought it, been using it for a long, long while. In fact, if you can find me another leather-bound New Testament like that, I'd like to have it. I'll be glad to pay for it. Uh, I've marked and through this one so many times, <laughs> getting to where I don't have any room to put any more notes. But what's, what's interesting is when you find a word that's translated wrong. Give me a word that you know is translated wrong. <clears throat> New Testament, pardon? It's translated wrong. I think at Easter. Yeah. That's King James. King James. King James just sort of dropped it. What is the word in the original? Passover. Passover. And one time those guys got carried away and translated the word Passover by the word Easter. Give me a break. Well, what do you do with that? I'd write through the word Easter and put the word Passover. Why? That's what it says. Give me another word that is translated wrong by most translations. Well, maybe I should back up. What word is not translated but is transliterated? You ready? Baptism. There's the word. It is word baptisma. And it is translated baptism. No, it's not translated. What did they do? The word is baptize. No, it's the word baptizo and they translated it baptize. Now translate it for me. What is the word baptize translated? What, what does it translate? Immerse. Immerse. immerse plunge. To dip. Yeah. To plunge. To immerse. To bury. To bury. Romans 6. Well, now what do I need to do when I'm reading, studying the Bible with someone? And this gets awkward because here you are using a translation, you're studying with someone, and what you're going to have to do is get out your what? Translate the, what the word actually means. Yeah. yeah. So you can't go straight to the word and say this is what it means. You got to dig into what it actually means. Yeah. Go to the word and you use your what? Vines. Your vines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, almost pull him out. You pull out your vines expository. You pull out your dictionary, and there it is. Uh, now, the word sprinkle is in the Bible. You do that. Referring to the blood. The sprinkling of the blood, blood, Hebrews 9 and 10. But it's not never used in connection with that. It's the word rantizo. And if you rantize somebody, all you've done is sprinkle them. Uh, it's rather intriguing. The word sprinkle is used only in connection with the sprinkling of the blood of the calf under the Old Covenant. But the word is not translated. 
the word baptizo is the word that is translated immerse, to dip, to plunge, to immerse. And, in, and baptism is the act of dipping, plunging, immersing. But it's, it's a mistranslation. So what are we going to do? Just bide our time and go on and play like we're dummies? Or are we going to deal with the word? What are we going to do? I think we have no choice. We've got to deal with the word as it appears and know, know that we're dealing with the word as it appears, not to satisfy the preacher's prejudice on this occasion, the teacher's prejudice. No, that's not a prejudice. The word ek means of. It never means in or into. And the word in does not mean of. There's the original language. And you can look at it. So much. Well, that's not a big deal. I think it is. Well, it is because most people will never know that. <clears throat> well, Truly, they won't be taught that. And you do get a bit of different meaning. Yeah. Yes, you read it quite a bit. Well, yeah. you, get, you get a more complete look, like we're mm -hmm. talking about, because without Christ's life and laying the foundation, mm -hmm. exemplifying his faith, then we have no reason to carry it forward in his mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. So they tie together, and probably most people maybe understand that. They don't understand it those well from that reading if they twist it that way a little bit. Though. Mm -hmm. again, it's, it's more dependent on us and what we're doing rather than really a partnership. And, Mostly ninety percent him, you know, with what he did. How could how could we believe in or have faith in someone or something that did not also possess faith, or was not faithful, or was not faithful? Yeah, and the thing that is true of Christ is he was obedient, even to the point of death. Even to the point of death, Philippians two. Faithful in all things. Uh, homework assignment. We're not getting away from our class. But see how many passages you can find in the New Testament that use the expression, the faith. Jude 3, that don't, don't go on your list, we've already got it. Uh, but look up the expression, the faith. What in the world is it talking about? Now this is interesting. Uh, the faith is as objective as the faith of Christ is objective. It's not subjective. It is the faith. How many you can find? But... Uh, in conjunction with that, I want us to branch off into another area of study. And I want us to talk about, I'm going to give you the assignment of looking at John chapter 3. And who's talking in John 3? Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And what is he talking about? And... I want you to pull together connective passages that are talking about the same subject <laughs> in John chapter 3. Now the Lord willing, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll talk about the faith. We'll talk about uh, what John's talking about to Nicodemus. And we get hung up on, and we get, because it's a complicated, difficult text. It's been a point of discussion again and again and again. Well, what's Jesus actually really talking about? And he talks about the same subject in at least two additional passages. So do some homework on it. I'm not passing out a handout because my computer died. We're going to have a funeral probably not too far hence. But it's only 12 years old, and we've had all kinds of problems. I have had all kinds of problems. However, with it. we do have a new one right across the room. But so it's hers. And, <laughs> and, and, it's, and, it, and it is nervous. <laughs> it, it is nervous. You got the prayer on yours? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I, I wrote an article and sent it off for publication, and so it helped me after I sent it off. I was looking, and her machine puts two mistakes in the article. I just don't know what to do about that. But, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. True. Not an operator error. <laughs> not an operator error. Oh. Or something else. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to have you here. Appreciate you, the opportunity to study with you. Just type in the end instead of